The following program is sponsored by CBN. Coming up. And God will make a way. The newest inductee into the Gospel Music Hall of Fame. I believe God's not finished with me yet. Singer-songwriter Don Moen looks back at his legendary career. I know why you're here. I know why you're here. I know why you're here. Why am I here? And then... I remember the sound of me screaming through the snorkel tube. Face to face with a hungry shark. He had my whole arm in his mouth. One diver squares off against nature's greatest predator. Yeah, I see blood everywhere, all around her. And lives to tell the tale. And I remember thinking, no, I'm not going to die here. On today's 700 Club. Welcome, folks, to this edition of the 700 Club. President Trump has received a king's welcome in England, a glittering dinner with the queen, uh, a meeting uh, at the ambassador's home, a private dinner, uh, a viewing of the guard. There's been something else. And now he's making a speech having to do with the brave men who stormed the beaches of Normandy on D-Day. Uh, it's, it's been quite a time. Some protests, but Trump, in a speech with the existing prime minister, sort of blew it off. And uh, it's been an amazing time for him and all of us. And by the way, I'm glad to be back with you. I appreciate Gordon being here. Uh, yesterday was his 61st birthday, and I had a fall. I broke three ribs. It was the most painful experience that I've ever had, I think. I broke eight ribs in a horse accident, but this... This was more painful. Much more. It was Wonder on why. a scale of one to tell. Well, I, I fell so hard, and I fell against the chair, oh. and uh, there was a huge bruise, and then, yeah, it's been something, but uh, uh, us old guys are tough, and we try to stay in there and keep on going. And here you are, already back. I'm huh? back, back, ready at work. to go, but uh, it, it's getting a whole, it's a whole lot better, for which I'm very grateful, and thanks for your prayers. Well, Dale Hurd has the uh, story about the Trump visit. The president helped kick off two days of D-Day observances in Portsmouth, England, by reading excerpts of a prayer that President Franklin Roosevelt read to the nation on June 6, 1944. Give us faith in thee, faith in our sons, faith in each other, and faith in our united crusade. Thy will be done. Almighty God. It was a somber and peaceful atmosphere after the protests that greeted the president in London. Americans never make this much fuss when British leaders visit, but the British left has hated the last several Republican presidents, and street fights were breaking out in Whitehall between leftists and Trump supporters in their MAGA hats. I think the man's a danger to the world. You know, his foreign policy, the, th the state, his behavior. I see him as one of the world leaders that I can actually relate to as a working class citizen. Um, he's a businessman himself. He knows how to be successful. He knows what he wants and he speaks the truth. While the London police had their hands full, the president was smoothing over his past criticism of Prime Minister Theresa May, expressing thanks for his royal welcome from the Queen. It was very, very special. And the president tried to compliment May over her failed attempts to secure a Brexit deal, which has led to her planned resignation as Prime Minister in a few days. I would have sued and settled, maybe. Perhaps you won't be given the credit that you deserve. Trump said Britain and the U.S. would be able to strike a phenomenal trade deal once the U.K. has left the E.U. It's the greatest alliance the world has ever known. Trump praised conservative lawmaker Boris Johnson, who's campaigning to replace me as leader of the Tory party. He also met with Brexit party leader Nigel Farage, who may also run for prime minister. But he turned down a requested meeting from Labour Party leader Jeremy Corbyn and hit back at one of his most vocal critics, London Mayor Sadiq Khan. He's done a poor job. And as for that 20-foot-tall, diaper-clad Trump baby blimp flying in London, the president simply brushed it off. And I heard that there were protests. I said, where are the protests? I don't see any protests. I did see a small protest today when I came, very small. The media is portraying Trump's trip as a low moment for the special relationship. 
but it seems to have gone much better than many expected. Dale Hurd, CBN News. Well, in other news, Republican senators say they strongly oppose the president's plan to, a plan to put tariffs on goods from Mexico. I tend personally to agree with them. John Jessup has more. That's right, Pat. The senators believe tariffs will hurt the economy, essentially imposing a tax increase on American consumers. Starting Monday, the president wants a 5% tariff on Mexican imports increasing up to 25% over time. His goal is to spur Mexico into curbing the flow of Central American migrants headed to the U.S. border. Senate Republicans are considering blocking the move and may have a veto-proof majority. The president says they'd be foolish to try to stop him. And Pat, the administration says Trump's declaration of a national emergency at the border justifies those tariffs. Uh, I think he's right. There is a crisis at the border. Uh, there are people actually coming now from Africa uh, who are trying to get into the United States. Uh, they're not just poor people from Latin America. Uh, this has been a the problem is, as the senators pointed out so well, Tariffs are one thing, immigration policy is another. They shouldn't be mixed up. And I think the senators are right. Uh, we can't get a border control measure taken uh, along with a tax uh, move. That's not the same thing, and they shouldn't do it. And it's going to hurt American uh, trading relations. And this is about the time that he wanted to sign a, a deal for a North American uh, alliance will include Canada, the United States, and Mexico. Uh, that's to replace what he hated as, as NAFTA. So in any event, uh, it's in place. I hope he changes his mind. John. Pat, continuing on monetary policy, Federal Reserve Chairman Jerome Powell may move to protect the economy from problems stemming from conflicts with trade, indicating the Fed might cut interest rates. That sparked stocks to their second best day of the year Tuesday, with the Dow up 512 points. Powell said policymakers don't know how the trade issues will be resolved, but the Fed will work to sustain the economy. Well, in Los Angeles, growing sanitation problems are causing a health scare at City Hall. At least one police officer has been diagnosed with typhoid. Homeless camps set up near the building are attracting rats and other vermin, a private pest control company told the LA Times. The company cited poor sanitary conditions, including leftover food, human waste, and hypodermic needles in the camps. But Los Angeles Mayor Eric Garcetti says it's not the homeless who are causing the problem, rather blaming it on the illegal dumping of trash. He's called on city workers to do a better job of cleaning up the building. I want my rank and file to be protected, and I demand that the leadership of this department make sure it swiftly takes care of that. We put a record amount of money into the police budget this year, and it's my expectation that they'll maintain that and protect our officers. The Times reports there were complaints of rats, mice, and fleas in 20 locations at City Hall. Well, turning to the Midwest, where record-breaking floods continue to swamp several states, this after nearly two weeks of severe weather brought heavy rain and tornadoes. At least three people have been killed so far, and tens of thousands have been displaced. Evacuations have been ordered as the Missouri, Mississippi, and Arkansas rivers have swelled to new heights. And it's not expected to let up. The National Weather Service is expecting at least seven more days of heavy rain. Vice President Mike Pence paid a visit to Tulsa, Oklahoma yesterday to speak with victims and survey the damage. Pat, back to you. Uh, it's an amazing thing that Tulsa, Oklahoma, is being considered as a disaster area in relation to floods uh, all the way up the uh, Mississippi, the Arkansas rivers, the various rivers that are flowing into that basin. They're all at flood stage. They're all overflowing their banks. Uh, it, it is a serious blow to the heartland. And I don't know that we've seen the consequences. You see, right now, this is the planting season. The farmers can't get into their fields to plant. That means the agricultural co companies can't sell their tractors and their harvesters and their combines and the other stuff they sell. It means the seed companies can't sell their seeds. And so it's a major blow to our economy. We haven't seen the consequences yet, but it, it is serious. And the, the rains keep coming. And uh, it's, uh, I read that the uh, uh, sunspot activity is at an all-time low right now, which may or may not affect our weather, but it, it does mean that whatever is going on 
is not pleasant for the long-range future of America. So I haven't seen the uh, cost in dollars and cents, but this is a major problem, and we're looking at the breadbasket of this great nation. We're looking at Oklahoma. We're looking at uh, Nebraska. We're looking at uh, now Arkansas, and then of course you've had Iowa and other uh, states that have joined the Mississippi River, all of which are suffering major flooding. John. Pat, Virginia Governor Ralph Northam is calling a special session of the legislature. He wants to debate new gun control laws after 12 Virginia Beach City employees died in a mass shooting last Friday. CBN News national security correspondent Eric Phillips has more. Governor Northam praised first responders for the job they did in Virginia Beach, but now he's calling on lawmakers to be second responders, he says, to show up on the scene and try to put an end to this type of violence. But some believe it's more about politics than protection. I will be asking for votes and laws, not thoughts and prayers. Governor Ralph Northam showed frustration as he stood at the podium Tuesday morning after spending the weekend comforting Virginia Beach families, saying it's happened again, hearkening back to the 2007 Virginia Tech shooting where more than 30 died in a mass shooting. Once more, hearts are broken, lives are shattered, and families are crushed. Northam is calling for a special legislative session where he'll push for gun legislation that Republicans blocked in the last session to include universal background checks, a ban on assault weapons, including suppressors like the one used by the Virginia Beach shooter, reinstating the one handgun a month law and expanding local authority to regulate firearms. Republican House Speaker Kirk Cox fired back with a statement saying in part, the governor's call to special session is hasty and suspect when considered against the backdrop of the last few months. An apparent reference to the months long investigation into whether Northam appeared in blackface in a college yearbook picture. The result, inconclusive. The issue just as divisive at the federal level. Senate Democrat Joe Manchin on Sundays faced the nation. I'm just asking my Republican colleagues and friends to use some common sense and let's do things that basically will protect the public. You have laws on the books that, that, that make murder illegal and yet people still do it. Laws are not going to fix everything. Virginians deserve leadership and they will be watching. The nation will be watching. The special session will convene in two weeks, and while the governor can call that session, Republicans say he cannot dictate what is discussed, and they plan to use that time to talk about tougher sentences for those who use guns while committing crimes. In Washington, Eric Phillips, CBN News. Thanks, Eric. Pat? Uh, I, I tend to agree with those who are criticizing. You know, Governor Northern, it wasn't just the blackface that shocked us. His statement as a pediatrician was more callous when he talked about a baby who was born after what is called a botched abortion, a baby who was born alive. And this pediatrician was saying, well, we'll keep the baby comfortable till we decide how to dispose of him. So essentially he was advocating infanticide. That to me is far, far greater than some uh, gun violence. And I live and we live, our headquarters are in Virginia Beach. Uh, the mayor of the city uh, is a uh, graduate uh, and a professor, a part-time professor at Regent University. Uh, we are uh, very much intimately involved and our hearts have gone out to these victims of this shooting. But as was said by Rick Mulvaney, we have plenty of laws on the books. The laws don't stop. What's got to be done is to understand this violence, to do something about it. And although I don't think this was a case that in many of the cases of the uh, massive shootings, the shooters have been under the influence of various types of, uh, of drugs, uh, which have been prescribed by doctors and they cause some type of psychosis, which leads to this kind of violence. We've got to determine what is going on, why people are doing this. Why is it this violence? But while this is happening, we at CBN are really concerned about the people in our own community who have died. And we want to help the victims' uh, families 
uh, because they're suffering and they're grieving. There's going to be a service tomorrow night in Rock Church, and Gordon is going to be leading that service to pray for the families of the fallen victims, innocent people, hardworking, wonderful family people who are gunned down by senseless violence. But more laws controlling the, the spread of guns is not the answer. The answer is to get to the root of the violence that has gripped our nation. Now, by the way, we have a fund set up now for the victims of the Virginia Beach shooting. And everything that is given under this appeal will go to those families. Uh, it's CBN Center, Virginia Beach, Virginia. If you want to contribute to help them, uh, we'd love to have uh, your support. The number is 1-800-707-000 or CBN.com, VB Shooting Victims. And um, this is our fund for victims of the Virginia Beach shooting. This happened in our own backyard. The mayor, Bobby Dyer, is a dear friend and a uh, part-time professor of a number of years at Regent University. And he's grieved, we're all grieved, at the death of these marvelous people who were shot down by an angry former employee of the Public Works Department of the City of Virginia Beach. Well, apparently he was, he still had his badge. He was still actually employed and had given his two weeks. His notice, yeah. His two weeks notice. And I read the resignation notice. It was very short and sweet and professional. And they wrote him back and said, uh, we hope you'll change yeah. your mind. Um, and then he goes in the next day. Bad guys are always going to get guns, no matter where. But do you, do you agree with, you know, like Senator Manchin that we need to use some common sense. Uh, Manchin's a great guy. I, I think the world of Joe Manchin, and I think what he said is very reasonable. There's no question about it. Uh, but it's, it's, it's not going to be gun, more gun restrictions. That's not the answer. The answer goes far beyond that. But there is a wave of violence in our nation. There's a bloodlust that is, has seized there. Our population, we find it coming up over and over again. But a lot of this anger is out there. Why is it there? Uh, I don't know. But uh, what we need is the move of God to, to give peace uh, and harmony and love in our society so that these people won't go kill each other. Now, there's something else that's in the news that I think is so important. In Parkland, uh, there was a, a, a tragic shooting and a deputy, uh, I guess it's one of what they call rent a cops, uh, was on duty. And instead of going in to challenge the shooter, he stayed outside and actually kept people from helping. So here's the story about what's going to happen to him. John. That is right, Pat. That Florida Sheriff's deputy who failed to engage the suspect in last year's deadly Parkland school shooting is facing 11 criminal charges, including child neglect, culpable negligence and perjury. Authorities arrested Scott Peterson Tuesday. The former Broward County Sheriff's deputy was employed as the school resource officer when a gunman went on a rampage, killing 17 students inside the school. Video shows Peterson standing outside the building, but never going in. He says he thought the shots were coming from outside. Some of the victim's parents applauded the arrest. Peterson could face nearly 100 years in prison. Well, hundreds gathered on Capitol Hill Tuesday to mark one of the deadliest days in world history. Paul Strand was there for a rally commemorating the Tiananmen Square massacre 30 years ago this week. As President Nixon and the U.S. opened up China more in the 1970s and 80s, there was great hope that maybe they were going to come around. But then came the Tiananmen Square massacre, crushing the hopes of more than a billion people. But before that massacre came days of tens of thousands of hopeful Chinese pushing in the square and elsewhere for more freedom and democracy. Marion Smith of the Victims of Communism Memorial Foundation. It was a wave that was spread throughout uh, China in the spring of 89. It's a wave that we also saw in Europe that same year. Uh, unfortunately, in China, it was extinguished by the People's Liberation Army and the Chinese Communist Party, who were willing to murder their own citizens rather than talk about their legitimacy. As this rally noted, a dark time followed. Reggie Littlejohn fights against the Chinese totalitarian grip on childbirth, which has led to some 400 million abortions. At that time, at least, they could even gather on the square. Today. 
they don't have freedom of association. And if two people got together on the square and held up a sign, they would be immediately detained. That's how much uh, human rights have regressed since Tiananmen Square. Smith described what came after the massacre. Absolute prohibition on the exercise of political freedom, free speech, religious freedom, etc. And today under Xi Jinping, you see a hardening of that totalitarian state. He is a more dictatorial leader than any leader we've seen in China since Mao. Many remember one man after the massacre blocking tanks with his own body. Little John says such courage would get no respect today. There was one pastor's wife in Henan province in 2016 who stood in front of a bulldozer as it was bulldozing a church. She wouldn't move and she actually got bulldozed. She was killed, buried alive by the Chinese Communist Party. As more Americans than ever are leaning towards socialism, there's a lesson for them in Tiananmen Square. That's the fact that no collectivist government is ever going to lead you towards more rights and more freedom. Paul Strand, CBN News, Capitol Hill. It is an honor to be here. Thanks, Paul. Pat, back to you. If you can think back in history, the town of Baku was a noted oil uh, capital. The city was alive with oil derricks bringing that precious subject, uh, substance out of the ground. Uh, it's now part of the nation of Abergerjan, and Wendy has more. All right, well, coming up, the Muslim nation with an unlikely ally, Israel. You'll see why the friendship between the Jewish state and Azerbaijan goes back thousands of years. So don't go away. Hey, welcome back. You're watching the 700 Club, and I'm glad to be here with you. And uh, having had a little bit of an accident, I'm back on track, and I'm thrilled to be here with you. Three ribs broken, but you're three ribs back broken, with us. And, and uh, I had 13. I mean, at eight before the, from an accident with a horse, uh, I had a, a body scan about these, and it said all the eight have healed which I'm grateful. <laughs> then I, you only have so many ribs, and I, <laughs> I broke eight of them. I'm 11 of them, so th these are the last three. Last three. Well, let's pray. That's it. Yeah, no more. I hope so. <laughs> well, folks, anti-Semitism, like it or not, sadly, is on the rise around the world. But one Muslim nation is making friends with Israel and the Jewish people. CBN Middle East Bureau Chief Chris Mitchell shows us the city of Azerbaijan, where I told you the capital of Baku was a famous oil depot. Can that country become a model for the rest of the Muslim world? Let's see. Sitting at the crossroads of Europe and Asia, Azerbaijan is strategically positioned close to Iran, Turkey, and Russia with a major asset to the east. This is Baku, the capital of Azerbaijan. Located on the Caspian Sea, the country is one of the world's major oil producers. And Baku is the country's economic center. Azerbaijan is a source for about uh, between anything between quarter to one third of the oil cons uh, import to Israel. And this flow of high quality oil is very important for the state of Israel. Oil isn't the only thing flowing between the two countries. According to Azeri President Ilham Aliyev, Azerbaijan has purchased nearly $5 billion worth of weapon systems from Israel. And this is important for Azerbaijan to maintain its defense and its existence in a very uh, challenging uh, strategic environment. CBN News talked with Israel's ambassador to Azerbaijan, Dan Stav, about his efforts to diversify the economic cooperation between the two countries. Israel can be of help, especially in the development of the agricultural sector, which is a top priority of the government. And we have a cooperation with medical institutes, and medical domain in general, education, IT. And the relationship goes beyond economy and defense. To be an ambassador to Azerbaijan is a special privilege as the relations between the Jewish people and the Azeri people 
preceded the, the relations between the two states. And the mountainous Jewish community, according to some historical account, preceded Islam, Christianity. The first Jews, according to some uh, myth, uh, arrived to Azerbaijan after the destruction of the northern kingdom of Israel in 722 before Christ. The vast majority of the population is Shiite Muslim, but it's a secular country. For generations, the Jewish community has felt at home. And since its independence, Azerbaijan has had good relations with Israel. For centuries, Jews and Azerbaijanis lived in peace, friendship, and continue to live here in Azerbaijan. And the Jewish community of Azerbaijan is a very active part of our society. They contribute a lot to the development of modern Azerbaijan. The attitude that you've shown to Jewish people in Azerbaijan over, over the years. The world sees so much intolerance, so much darkness, and here is an example of what relations can be and should be between Muslims and Jews everywhere. Some 70,000 Azeri Jews have immigrated to Israel, and Netanyahu sees them as a bridge between the two countries. Many regularly visit their homeland. You don't do it if you come from a, an environment that infested with anti-Semitism. The two countries have had diplomatic relations since 1992, after the fall of the Soviet Union. We don't consider uh, Muslims as our enemies, and Azerbaijan is a proof that this is not the case. In sharp contrast, Iran is the other Shiite Muslim majority country in the neighborhood. There are such talking differences between the two countries and uh, Azerbaijan showed that it's not a matter of Shia. Despite years of animosity, Stav said there's a growing understanding among Muslim states in the region. Israel is not an enemy and that cooperation can be very beneficial. Their hope is that this example of Muslim and Jew standing together will serve as an anchor of stability in the Middle East. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Jerusalem. Very encouraging and it might seem without question that the uh, Gulf states, uh, the states like Saudi Arabia, the Emirates, uh, Kuwait, and so forth, uh, have realized that their major enemy is Iran, and they are uh, making overtures toward Israel. And this overture from Azerbaijan, uh, to me, is a very encouraging sign. Wouldn't it be wonderful if people lived in harmony and love with each other? It doesn't have to be the terrible um, animosity that exists today. But anyhow, th that's an important story, and I appreciate uh, Chris bringing it to us. Yeah, you could just see the respect between those two leaders. Yeah, absolutely. Amazing. Well, up next, a mother of three sees the black, beady eyes of a shark and then feels its razor-sharp teeth chomping her arm. When I yanked the last time, his jaws opened up and I remember when my arm popped out, I looked at it and I was just in shock because it was completely gone. See how a series of miracles helped save her life. Plus, we'll be praying for you and your needs, so don't go away. Hey, welcome. It's the 700 Club and you're on with Wendy and Pat and we're here for you. And I want to introduce you to Tiffany Johnson. Tiffany's day began with parasailing over the Bahamas. What a wonderful vacation. But it ended with an emergency medevac to the States. That's because Tiffany's dream vacation was interrupted after a major attack by what is called a bull shark in the shallows of the ocean. Tiffany Johnson and her husband, JJ, were enjoying a day of snorkeling while on a cruise. But he started feeling sick and headed back to the boat. In the meantime, my wife is just out there snorkeling by herself. Never thought that she was in any kind of danger. But in these waters, danger is always close by. And I felt like I had bumped into something. I was face to face with the shark. He had my whole arm in his mouth. I remember the sound of me screaming through the snorkel tube. Tiffany was in a fight for her life. 
I felt the strength of the Lord just come out from inside of me and give me the strength to fight. And I remember thinking, no, I'm not gonna die here. You are not gonna take my life. So I started to yank harder. When I yanked the last time, his jaws opened up. And I remember when my arm popped out, I looked at it and I was just in shock because it was completely gone. That's when I hear Tiff scream. And she screamed, help me, help me, Jesus. And I remember looking at her, half of her right arm was gone. And it's just mangled, you know, mangled stump. And I see blood everywhere all around her. I screamed baby and I jumped off the boat after her. And the first thing that I heard her doing was praying. The boat's captain threw out a rope and JJ and Tiffany pulled themselves in. The moment I hit that boat, the peace of the Lord was so strong. It was like a tangible cloud, a presence that I have never felt before. As the boat sped back towards the dock, JJ made a tourniquet out of a towel, trying to stem the flow of blood from Tiffany's arm. I just laid my head on his lap and I just began to pray in the Holy Spirit, praying for my husband to give him strength. And I prayed for my kids. I prayed in that boat that God would use this for His glory. That was the only time that I felt like, oh my gosh, my, my wife could die on me. Once back on shore, they called an ambulance. Tiffany was rushed to the Nassau Hospital and taken into surgery. I remember making phone calls to her immediate family, my immediate family, telling them what happened, just to pray for her. So I was just praying that the Lord would just heal my wife, that she would be okay, that she was gonna make it through this. The surgery lasted four hours, but it wasn't over. After the surgery, the doctor approached me and told me, Mr. Johnson, your wife, she's stable and we stopped the bleeding, but she needs to see an American doctor as soon as possible. Without proper and immediate care, Tiffany could lose what was left of her arm, or worse, develop a life-threatening infection but they really just did not have the resources like we do here. And so I was in a lot of pain. But getting back to America wasn't so easy. We knew that we needed an act of God and a miracle for us to get back. Their only option was to hire a medevac crew that would fly them from Nassau back to the States. It cost $16,000 for the medevac flight. The medevac company told um, JJ, you know, if we don't get this pre-approved, chances are it's gonna be an out-of-pocket expense. JJ was more than willing to pay, but the couple still prayed for another miracle. Two hours later, they got a call from the medevac company. You don't have to worry about one penny of it, we'll take care of it. And I remember JJ hanging up on the phone and just bawling. Less than 24 hours later, Tiffany and JJ landed in Charlotte where an ambulance was waiting. It's just incredible just to see how God moved the mountains for us to get back home. And we didn't waver on, on our faith. Uh, we just knew that He was going to come through. Tiffany never fought infection and had two more successful surgeries, one of which was an innovative nerve transfer surgery that allowed her to control a prosthetic arm. I remember tears kind of starting to roll down my cheeks as I was realizing that everyday tasks are not going to be the same. And JJ like uh, looked over at me, he's like, it's okay, we're going to gonna establish our new normal now. And they have done just that. Tiffany leads worship at church, and together she and JJ continue raising their three children, Kylie, Luke, and Natalie. They thank God for his faithfulness through everything. My prayers were definitely answered more than I could ever imagine. She's not only alive, but she's thriving. And her testimony is one that's going to last for ages. The tears I cry are not of depression and frustration and why me? They're tears of gratitude that I'm even here. Like I shouldn't even be alive. So it's just a limb. <laughs> so anytime I do get frustrated or feel like, oh, this is just not fun, you know, it's just a reminder that I'm here and I'm alive and God's in this and He's using it. It's a wonderful word. I'm here and I'm alive. I'm here and I'm alive. Yes, 
She's missing an arm, but they've gotten a prosthetic arm. Thank the Lord. But I'm here and I'm alive. Here's some a prayer requests we have for today, and we want to pray for you in just a moment. Lois, who lives in Jacksonville, Texas, experienced awful back pain. Now, this is an answer, not a prayer request. One day things changed. She watched the 700 Club, and she heard Wendy say, someone hurt your back. You're praying and asking God to heal her. Lois said, I'll take that word. Her pain went away. She called our prayer center and was excited to tell us that now Lois of Jacksonville, Texas, completely healed. What do you Praise the Lord. Here's one, Pat. Dora of Austin, Texas, endured pain in her ankles every day for over 20 years. She kept persevering and trusting God. Well, recently, Dora heard you give a word of knowledge, Pat, for the healing of someone's ankle. By faith, Dora believed and was healed. The pain is finally gone after 20 years. She's extremely grateful for God's healing power and for his perfect timing. Praise Jesus. I'm here and I'm alive. If you're alive, the power of God is available. Actually, it's available even if you're dead, but nevertheless, we're not talking about that. We're talking about somebody who's alive and God wants to reach out and touch you right now. Now, Wendy and I are going to pray, and the Bible says if two of you will agree on earth as touching anything that they will ask, it will be done for them by my Father which is in heaven. Very simple. It's the word of the Lord, and it's Jesus. And with him, all things are possible. Now, we're going to join hands together, and I want you to pray. There's nothing impossible with the God we serve. Amen. I join hands with Wendy, and we believe God Amen. together. Father, with God, all things are possible. You said it, and we believe it. And therefore, in this audience, there are people who've been suffering with conditions. Someone right now has a kidney failure, and God Almighty right now is reaching out to touch you by the power of God now. In Jesus' name. Jesus' name. Wendy, what does uh, God say? Your name is Jack. You've been diagnosed with a prostate cancer. God says you will live and not die. You're being healed. Receive it and believe it in Jesus' name. Thank you, uh, Jesus. Somebody, you have bleeding gums. There's, there's an infection in your mouth and your gums are bleeding and, and uh, it's really a serious thing. If you just put your hand over your mouth in the name of Jesus, touch, receive a healing. Wendy. Someone, you just need to know that everything is going to be okay. There's a lot of anxiety and turmoil going on, and God is speaking to you right now, and His words to you are, it is going to be okay, in Jesus' name. Thank you. Oh, you, you you're gripped by fear right now. You, you are so afraid of everything, and you don't have to fear. The Bible says, fear not, I am with you. Perfect love casts out fear. And we cast out a spirit of fear out of your life right now in Jesus' name. Wendy. Thank you, Lord. There's someone you just, uh, you have some sort of devastating accident, and you saw this story that we just aired, and you're saying, God, I need that kind of miracle. I need that kind of intervention. And the Lord is saying, yes, and you're going to get it. Just start praising the Lord in Jesus' name. You've been having night sweats as a virus in your bloodstream. Right now, that virus is being killed. God is making you whole in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Amen, amen. and amen. Thank you, Please call us. We love to hear from you. We love to have the answer to prayers, and uh, we'll share them as appropriate with the audience. But the telephone number is easy to remember. No money involved. 1-800-700-7000. If you need uh, Further prayer, somebody's here on the telephone, people who love you, they'll pray with you. All you have to do is pick up the phone and call. Uh, Wendy, we've got a special treat. Yes, we love Don Moen. Well, Gospel Music Hall of Famer Don Moen reveals the piece of advice that launched his career. I'd hear another voice saying, Don, just be yourself. And I've realized God will not anoint who you want to be. He anoints who you are. Amen. Start Don Moen shares the lessons he's learned both on and off the stage when we come back.
Welcome back to Washington for this CBN News break. The state of Maine is now one step closer to legalizing doctor assisted suicide. It passed the Democrat led Senate Tuesday and would allow doctors to prescribe terminally ill people a fatal dose of medication, but does not consider it suicide under state law. Critics argue doctors can make mistakes and that the bill could have unintended consequences. The measure now heads to Democratic Governor Janet Mills, who has 10 days to act on the bill. Her office said she has not yet taken a position. Well, it's been almost 25 years since the beginning of the Brownsville revival and Pensacola outpouring. Those revivals went on for years with accounts of supernatural manifestations of God's spirit touching millions of people who then helped spread it around the globe. The ministry Christ for All Nations is asking God to do it again. Evangelist Daniel Kalenda says in all his travels, he meets young people who are hungry to experience the power of the Holy Spirit at work in their lives. Well, you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website at CBNNews.com. Pat and Wendy will be back with more of the 700 Club right after this. Throughout his storied career, Don Moen has been a singer, songwriter, worship leader, head of a record label, and president of a nonprofit. But no matter what hat he's wearing, this Gospel Music Hall of Fame inductee says he works towards one goal, to share the hope that is found through faith in the Lord. And God will make a way. Don Moen, a pioneer of the modern praise and worship movement, was recently inducted into the Gospel Music Hall of Fame. CBN caught up with the internationally renowned worship leader, songwriter, and executive for the GMA Honors and Hall of Fame ceremony in Nashville. You know, I look up to these guys there and the gals, they're my heroes. I thank God for the things I've gotten to do all over the world, and uh, uh, I, I believe God's not finished with me yet. I just want the house was packed with gospel greats, and the evening was filled with special musical tributes. Amid the celebration, Don's heart overflowed with gratefulness. Many years ago, I was praying about writing new songs, and God spoke to me very clearly from the book of Psalms, chapter 40, verse 3. It says, I have put a new song in your mouth, a song of praise to our God, and I'm thankful to God for answering my prayer. While a student at Oral Roberts University in the early 70s, Don began touring with the musical group Living Sound and evangelist Terry Law. For 10 years, he ministered internationally. By 1986, he recorded Give Thanks for the Hosanna Praise and Worship series at Integrity Music and eventually went on to become president of the label for 20 years. It was just worship leaders uh, leading worship at their churches. And my job was to find where God was moving. And usually if I found a church where God was moving, there were songwriters who were writing songs coming out of the movement. With more than 30 years of experience in ministry, he shares wisdom that made all the difference in his career. And I'll get on the stage with you know, all of my heroes and I would feel so insignificant and I would look at, I say, I know why you're here, I know why you're here, I know why you're here, why am I here? And when I get up to sing, uh, one voice I would hear would be, Don Moen, you better dial this up because Don Moen is not enough. And then I'd hear another voice, which I believe is the Holy Spirit saying, Don, just be yourself. And then I've realized God will not anoint who you want to be, He anoints who you are. Starts there. So I would say to uh, worship leaders and artists all over the world, just be yourself. Don and Laura, his wife of 46 years, live in Nashville. They have five children and seven grandchildren, but he opened up about their past struggles to have a child and hopes their story will encourage couples. We were married 12 years before we had any children. We could not have children, we didn't think. Didn't share this with a lot of our friends about not being able to have children. Because I didn't want them to think, poor Don and Laura, they're so unhappy. We were happy, but in our heart, we really wanted children. And the fact that the Lord did that for us is such a miracle. I write about this story in the book, God Will Make a Way. And I, you know, the Lord has given me faith 
to believe that he will do for other couples what he did for us. He will make a way. Don is currently writing a new project, and his YouTube channel, DonMowen.tv, features teaching, training, and new music for subscribers. He's president of Don Moen Productions and oversees his international nonprofit ministry, Worship in Action, which partners with CBN's Operation Blessing. Uh, I, I can't think of anybody better than Operation Blessing in terms of the work they're doing around the world. Uh, one of my most well-known songs, God Will Make a Way, it, it is a song of hope. And when I see these stories uh, that are shared uh, on the 700 Club, uh, just bringing hope to people who have lost hope. That's what it's about. And it's been my honor to partner with Operation Blessing really all over the world. 2019 Gospel Music Hall of Fame inductee, Don Moen, leaving a legacy of sincere worship and leading people to experience God's presence in new and beautiful ways. Worship transcends cultures and denominations and generations. It brings everyone together. And I'm very, very honored and humbled to see what God has done with that. Well, we are big fans of Don right here at the 700 Club. Don mentioned his latest book. It's called God Will Make a Way, the title of his most popular song, or at least one of them. And you can pick up a copy in stores nationwide. Congratulations to Don Moen. Well, guess what? It's time okay. for questions. Let's do it. <laughs> it's time. Let's do it. Kareen right. says, I am in a nursing home. I am on a ventilator with a trach in my neck from a collapsed lung. I'm unable to use my arms. And when walking, I can't stand up straight. The ventilator prevents me from eating solid food and talking. Does God hear my prayers and praises when I speak to him through my thoughts, even though I can't talk? Oh, uh, talking has got nothing to do with it. It's your spirit that's communing with the Lord. And the Lord hears the cry of your spirit, and he loves you. A broken and a contrite heart thou will not despise. Your body is broken, but your spirit is still alive. And God, of course, is hearing your prayer. Of course he is, more so probably than somebody who's got all of his faculties. I mean, I, I just commend you on the fact that you still want to praise God and despite those difficulties. And I think the prayer would be that God will touch you physically and heal you. But yes. up to that point, absolutely, He hears and will answer those prayers that come from your heart. All right. Yes. Amen. Richard says, why is there such persecution of the Jewish people? They are the most peace-loving people on earth, and yet so many factions want to get rid of them. Um, folks, there is a devil. A devil. And the Jews are the evidence of God's on earth. They were given the oracles of God. They were given the gospels. The Lord Jesus was born to, as a Jew. He was a considered, they call him a rabbi, you know, my, my, my master. He, he, he grew up in a Jewish household. The devil hates that. And therefore, the devil hates the Jews, and he stirs up people against them. And this isn't rational. It's not uh, human. It is demonic. So that's the answer, all right? Allison writes, Pat, my husband's son is living in our cabin behind our house. He's 42 years old. He just can't get his life together and hold down a job. He locks himself in the cabin. He's constantly asking his dad for money, and his dad gives it to him, which makes me really mad. Now and again, he can't pay his rent, which is only $500 a month. I want him gone. He has brought in familiar spirits between my husband and his son. Do I have the right to kick him out? It's a bad situation all around. Oh, it's a question of a right between you and your husband. I mean, I, do you have a right? Uh, you have a right to insist as a wife that this kid get gone. Your husband is enabling something that is wrong. It's like people who enable an alcoholic, enable somebody who's got a... a drug uh, addiction. Your husband, by giving this kid money, is enabling uh, a wasted life. He needs to get thrown out of the house. He needs to get, you know, his life together and straighten up. And you have an absolute right to ask your husband to make it happen. But do you have a right to throw his son out of the house? Well, you've got to know your husband, but if most husbands wouldn't be real thrilled about that. So you might have a, a marital 
uh, dispute, but your husband ought to realize what he himself is doing, and it's wrong. All right. Good advice. David says, our U.S. federal debt is now over $22 trillion and getting worse each day. I've been waiting for a fiscal day of reckoning for years, and yet the debt gets worse and the U.S. economy keeps moving along. How can this be? Is a day of fiscal reckoning coming? Uh, I think when judgment comes to America, it's going to be a, a debt collapse that's going to bring it on. Uh, we can have a lot of things happen, nuclear uh, disaster and solar flare and all the rest of it. But I, I think our profligate spending, we are stealing the patrimony of our children and our grandchildren in order to have a, a high living today. And the one thing no politician wants to do is to say, I'm going to cut spending. That isn't popular. I'm going to do this program. I'm going to give you free this. I'm going to have socialized the other. I'm going to spend, 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 and keep running up the deficit. One day, God is going to call us into account, and it's going to be horrible. When we lose our reserve currency status, it's going to be awful. And is that the way the judgment will fall? It's part of what God might do as he deals with this nation unless we change our ways, and it doesn't look like it's going to happen. Well, today's Power Minute is from Psalm 34. I sought the Lord, and he heard me, and he delivered me from all my fears. For Wendy and I, this is Pat Robertson. See you later. Bye-bye.